Hey, good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? It's a good, it's pretty, I've just come, come in from the dog walk on the way to work. Lovely sunny morning. So uh, hopefully that's going to hold for the weekend. Um, so who have we got here? Oh, some familiar faces from earlier in the week. Hi, welcome, Oliver. Great Hello, to see you, Lisa. Ellen, you? I'm very good, thank you. Good, good, good. Um, good, good, good. Martin's there as well, sort of. Um, Tina, great. Lisa, lovely to see you. Brilliant. Philip, just joining. Excellent. So we have got a lot to crack through so I've had a couple of apologies um so first off I wanted to ask is it okay if I record this so I can then share that with um my apologies people um it you won't be on video it will just be me on the video so um would, would that be okay with people anybody got concern with that great loving the thumbs up thank you Tina that's exactly what I like to see <laughs> interaction thumbs up thumbs down find those emotions or reactions that's what they call it isn't that brilliant and uh, great you're in the chat box already fantastic so let's just check everybody's found the chat box so uh get me jealous what have you had for breakfast pop it in the chat box and if anybody's had full english i'm gonna shoot you down from here uh coffee Martin's running on caffeine great <laughs> Who's got their coffees with them? Uh, Lisa Tatsiria. Or Brenna Blueberries. Mm, loving the blueberries part of that. Oh, Oliver, you're on starvation rations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Philip's got toothache. Oh, my goodness. Well, Philip, thank you so much for joining us, complete with a sore tooth. I will... Um, ensure we make this fully worth worth your while being here with the with your toothache brilliant so um we're going to have the chat box we're going to be using that as we go along um i have my able assistant with me uh my lovely husband guy he's on here you'll notice there's a similarity in surname that's uh, there for a reason <laughs> um this is a family business so as i'm presenting and asking you questions and stuff he's going to be checking the chat box for me so um this is going to be a participative hour. If you think this was going to be a gentle start to your Friday, you've got that wrong. Um, I'm hoping you have all come to your laptops or computers or whatever equipped with pen and paper. Does everybody have pen and paper to make some notes? Yes, I do. Um, fantastic. I had one of my clients turn up yesterday, to two and a half hour. Uh, action club session. He was like, I haven't got a pen, Helen. We had to halt proceedings really whilst the pen no. was fetched. No. Uh, right. Excellent. So, without further Where's ado. Where's my oh, Can I, can you just pop on um, mute? Whoever's searching for mummy there, that would be lovely. Um, right. So, let's crack on. Five past. Uh, Guy, will you just keep an eye in case we have any late joiners to let them in? Perfect. So we are here to, let's get this here, right, excellent. So this morning we are covering the six steps to building a better business. Um, six, simple, well, not simple, they, well they are simple, they're not easy. <laughs> simple, straightforward steps to do that. So let me do a quick introduction. Um, so I'm Helen Pettybridge. I'm the MD and coach at Action Coach Chilton Central. Um, Action Coach is a franchise, in case you weren't aware of it. We've been going 27 years as a franchise, um, and I've been leading it in this South Bucks area for the last five years. Um, prior to that, uh, I had an illustrious career in the big corporate land uh, with people like Diageo, uh, GE, PepsiCo, um, so some super organizations very brand and marketing led um, my role there was a senior HR director supporting uh, the VPs and GMs so I got to know all areas of the business exceptionally well so um, 
Uh, and then I decided five years ago, enough of corporate, it's actually much more fun and much more rewarding uh, to work with our local SME businesses. And, and that's what I've been doing since then. So, and I'm an avid supporter of, of Bucks Business First, so it was just seemed so appropriate to sponsor their expo, which is uh, this week and next week. And um, that is how the majority of you have joined us today. So what I'm going to do is bring this uh, kind of mix of experience that we've got um, between my corporate experience and my SME experience and bring it all together for you this morning in these tips for growing your business. So I have to start off um, and actually no apologies to those of you who are on an early event uh, this week, which I also did uh, for the expo, because this is such an important formula. So it's a quick reminder for you. And for those of you who weren't there on Monday, here's, here's a good start. So get your pens out straight away. My favorite um, equation is, but for success in life, to have what you want to have in life, very simple all you need to do is look at who you are being and multiply that by who what what you're doing um, and that will indicate what you're going to have so what we end up having is a product of who we are being our attitude our approach to life what skills we're developing um, and combined with that and multiplied up by the actions we're taking. So if we're doing all action and no being, um, we're gonna potentially run around like headless chickens um, and not end up with what we want to have. If we're focused on the being and in some wonderful Zen-like state, uh, but we're not actually doing anything, equally we're not gonna end up having what we want to have. So, um, I always start my events with this because a lot of the time in, the, in your business, you'll be running around, making sure you're doing business development, you're doing whatever your business does, whether you're designing or looking after people or animals or whatever we've got. Um, so this is a time to stop and think. Um, and um, Guy, could you just maybe mute everybody and we'll... Um, <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Hang on, I found the button. There we go. Let's mute, mute all. There we go. Um, we use the chat box. Um, so um, I've lost where I was. Yes, we get carried away in our businesses, working very much not carried away. It's kind of the necessity of life sometimes, just crunching through stuff in the business. But actually, we need to take stock, step back, just focus a little bit of time, move off the doing into the being. And, and that's what you're doing here. You've invested an hour of your day to come and learn some stuff that you can then put into your business um, and, and learn how to run that business a bit smarter. So this really is an investment of time and I'm absolutely confident you're gonna get that time back again um, by applying what you learn here this morning. So when I'm talking and working with business owners, I'm always mindful of the ultimate objective um, that, is I find a very exciting objective for business owners, which is to create a commercial profitable enterprise that works so you don't have to. Now, the first time people hear that, they kind of step back and go, oh, hello. So what do I mean by that? I mean, creating a business, building it up in such a way that it will work without you in it. Now, a number of you might be sitting there this morning going, right, Helen, I am the business. There is there's one of me. I'm, I do everything. Um, and you know what? Pretty much most businesses start that way. But if we grow it in a mindful way, we can create, and it doesn't have to be a huge team. You can get a business that works without you with four or five employees if you do that planfully. And then you have got the opportunity for passive income that it's providing income for you um, whilst you're lying on the beach in Hawaii or wherever, um, uh, and that you have something that you could has value to sell um, when you are ready and you're done with your business. So um, let's have a quick comment in the chat box. Who's interested in ultimately creating a business that can work without you? It doesn't have to, but it has the opportunity. You could 
take off for a month and it would still work. Um, who's who's thinking about that for the first time? Going, mm, that sounds interesting. Uh, who's maybe already on that path and that is absolutely part of their objectives? Yeah, I'd love to hear in your chat box. What, what are your thoughts there? And then Guy, just read them out for us whilst they come in. Oh yes, you will have to unmute yourself. I cannot mute you there. All right, we've got Tina who has that always as the aim. Um, Fantastic. And, uh, uh, Lisa, who's definitely on that ball, um, but hasn't necessarily thought or planned about it yet. Okay. Um, Martin's been on the path, um, but he's got back in again. <laughs> Not surprising at the moment, uh, but he's aiming to get back on that path. And uh, Oliver as well definitely wants to do that. So everyone is doing that or thinking about that. Fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, so listen up. This is the path. It's our six steps. So um, it starts with um, mastery. So at the bottom of our model here is mastery. We've got to get a few things in good order in our businesses before we go too far. So this is where we're going to create order and stability, um, looking at four areas of mastery that I'll come on and describe very shortly. So in this mastery phase, we're getting control of our business. When we've got good enough control, we'll then step up into our niche layer. Now the niche layer is the sales and marketing layer. It's um, the most exciting layer. It's also in some ways the most frustrating layer because this is where we're, we're finding what I call the secret source for your business. And it's different for every single business. Finding that exact combination of the marketing strategies that work with the right wording, the right visuals, the right approach to the right target audience, getting that um, fine. And, and there's experiment, a lot of experimentation, testing and measuring going on in this layer. And then matching that with the optimal sales process so that uh, when we've found this secret source, this magic recipe for your business, we know that if, say, we invest 500 pounds in marketing, and we make a thousand pound profit off the back of that, um, then how often are we going to put that 500 pound in investing in our marketing? We're just going to keep doing it as much as we can, you know, cash flowing it, get it back, put it in, get it back. And what we've created is a system of predictable cash flow. If we need more business, we know we just pump more in the marketing and the profits come back. Anybody in that situation at the minute? Pop it in the chat box if you've got anybody there yet. It, it takes a little bit of getting to, and it is different. But even with an action coach, it's a franchise. There's 200 action coaches in the UK. You'd think they could tell us exactly how to um, bring on new clients. Nah, there's no proven formula. There's lots of different strategies that work well. The one that works really well for each of us as individuals in our different geographies and towns and with our different backgrounds is different. It, it needs its own little flavor. So. At the point we've got that secret, that, that secret recipe sourced and found it, um, we can then move up into leverage. So we've done all the experimenting, testing and measuring in niche. Leverage is all about efficiency. It's doing more with less, um, automating, systemizing. Um, but obviously there's no point in doing that till we found the proven way that works because otherwise we're going to be investing time and money probably in automating something that we're then going to have to change again. So we want to work out in the niche and mastery what's the absolute best way of running this business, then we can go into efficiency and leverage. So this is where we start to get time back and we certainly get consistency and reliability. And then we get major time back when we step up to team. So when we get team, we're starting to really structure for growth. Um, now, team comes after leverage because as you come out of leverage, you've got um, it, through that process, you've been defining the very best way to get things done in your business, how you would do them. And because you've defined that, you've captured that in position contracts, you've got uh, uh, IT systems that are supporting it. Then when as you 
go looking for the team, you don't need creators, you need doers because you need them to follow the process that you've created that is the best way of doing it. And therefore that broadens up your choice um, you need a, a less experienced, qualified individual often, which means um, salaries are a bit lower and your profitability is higher. So when they know what they're doing, because they've got clear guidance, clear processes, clear job descriptions, then they can onboard quicker, they can be more effective in role quicker, and therefore they become a, a profitable element of your business quicker. So that's why team comes after leverage. As you build up your team, you typically start with the most junior roles. I always say start with the um, <laughs> the activity you like least. Uh, so my world, bookkeeping, shh, that went out first off. Um, and then um, you, you gradually add the more senior people. And ultimately, when you put a general manager in place, um, that's when you can step away and you've got a business that works without you. Ha -ha. Um, so that point you can start taking passive income but it doesn't stop there because you can see we've got two more layers so synergy layer is all about taking this this well machine you've created you've created this kind of prototype of your business that is now working really well now there's an opportunity to amplify that so you might want to license it franchise it open another one of what you do in another town um, in another country, depending on your scale of your ambition. Um, but the critical thing is to get the first one, the first entity working really smoothly. Um, and then the second one you can bring up um, very quickly, very efficiently and very confidently. If you start a second one before you've got the first one sorted, then you've got sort of double trouble going on. Um, so we've then multiplied the scale of your profits coming in through the synergy process and we step up to results which is really our wealth management layer where we're looking at investments and property and, and how to maximize that. Um, and at that point, you know, you're at a, a great multiplier opportunity for a sale. So those are our six steps. <laughs> Sounds really nice and easy to talk it through. It's a lot of work, yes. Um, and most of that happens in the bottom four layers. And actually the, the hard work and, and uh, you know, you can spend the first, four years, five years in this niche mastery area, really getting clarity um, here. So um, let's have in the chat box, which layer do you think you're in at the moment uh, from that quick description? Just pop in the name of the layer. Are you in mastery and niche? Uh, have you got up to team yet? Um, team who are supporting, maybe doing your marketing, your sales, other elements of it. Let's see what we've got in the chat box. Let's quickly get that in there. Oh, it's taking a long time to work to, to, to write one layer. Oh, there we go. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Fantastic. I read out a few words for us. Uh, Latina's just launched a new website two weeks ago. So it gets going. Great. Uh, Lisa's in the mastery stage, uh, early stages of it. Lovely. Um, Oliver's in the team stage. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Right, so I'm going to crack on. We've got lots to cover. Um, and Oliver, you can test if you're really up in team or yours, because what we can do, oh, I'm echoing here. Um, Guy, can you pop back on mute? Lovely. Um, but depending on what your business is, sometimes you need to. I mean, it, like, um, actually, Oliver, you're in, in care. Clearly, that's not going to work without a team. Ditto hospitality, you know, you can't run a hotel with one person. Um, so sometimes we have to do a vertical through um, because you absolutely need team to run. So this is a an ideal model. Life's not like that. We end up jumping up and down between the layers. Um, so great. So here we go. Here are four areas of um mastery in that bottom layer we've got these four four layers destination mastery which is knowing where you're going uh, money mastery or the financial side of things time mastery and finally delivery mastery so time mastery is getting mastery of your time um and and we've got a top tip there and then delivery mastery is about it's not physically driving around delivering your product it's it's delivery mastery is is 
how you deliver your product or service to your customer, their whole experience and how consistent you are at delivering that experience for your customers. So we're gonna shoot very uh, quickly through each one of these. So destination mastery, this is having clarity of the ultimate goal. So, you know, Jim Rohn, great quote, you know, it was not Jim Rohn, it was Stephen Covey, Stephen Covey, start with the end in mind. So have you got a 10 year plan in place? Do you know ultimately what you want your business to look like? What revenue, what profits is it giving you? How big is it? Um, I, I drew my end state team of 11 players uh, five years ago. We're now at four. Uh, so I've got another five to go. But that's fine because I'm not meant to be there yet. Um, and actually, bizarrely, that I still have an old chart and I update it periodically and it still has somewhere between nine and 11 players. So I've got nine, 11 team members, my ultimate team structure um, that will deliver me the passive income that ultimately the business will be giving me. So have you got that clarity? Um, is that locked in a, in a 10 year plan? Have you got a five year view? It doesn't have to be a detailed plan for 10 years. It's just knowing what, what my, what's my aspiration here? What am I setting out to do? We do want to then start to have a five year plan with a few numbers on it and directionally, what's the product set that's gonna get you? What's the scale? How many customers do you need to deliver that? Um, then most critically, we want a 12 month plan that is outlining what you need to get done in that 12 month to get you on route to your five year. As, as humans, there is a massive tendency to underestimate what we can achieve in the longer term. So we underestimate what we can do in five years and we overestimate what we can do in the short term. So who, who's written a list, a to-do list for the week and got you know less than halfway through it? Uh, we tend to, oh, that, that's, we overestimate what we can get done in a day or done in a week, uh, underestimate the long term. But if we plan out that long term, then year by year by year in, in great detail, when we get yearly, we can um, achieve amazing things. Then we come down and we do a three month plan. Uh, some of you on this call uh, joined me on Monday when you created your first 90 day plan. Um, and then we take that into weekly. So to give yourself a score, if you like, on destination mastery, um, pop it in the chat box, just put your number in there, one out of 10, what would you give yourself for how good your planning is? Because uh, you need to know where you're going to be able to get there. So get that number in and uh, yeah, just add these up as you go along. So next one, money mastery or financial mastery. Some key elements we need to know. First off, know your break even point. So what do I mean by break even point? This is the point where your total costs are covered by your revenue. That's the point where you're not making money, but you're not losing money. So it's a really critical number to know. So yeah, let's see in the chat box. Do you know your break even point? So if you don't, first bit homework, work out your break even point, add up all your costs. Um, if, if you've got, you know, there'll be some annual costs like your insurance or registrations and things like that. Divide that by 12 so that's allocated each month and know your break even point each month. People who've got a very uh, rapid turnaround, like retailers, uh, they'll know their break even point on a day. They'll know, you know, right when we hit this much cash, oh, we hit two o'clock, we hit break even. Great. Everything beyond that's going to be profitable. So know your numbers there. Mm -hmm. Cash flow. So the thing that uh, ends most businesses, so most small businesses do not go bust because of lack of profit. They go bust because of lack of cash. So you can make a profit on paper um, in terms of you've secured that business, you've invoiced it, um, but if you haven't been paid it before the next money's going out and you've got salaries to pay, but you haven't got the money in, then you're gonna go bust. So um, this is, Utterly, utterly critical. You've probably heard the phrase, you know, revenue is um, vanity, um, profit is sanity, and cash flow is, sorry, and cash is king. Yeah. So we need the cash. Now, there's one thing wrong. So your cash flow is, is tracking and knowing the money coming in versus the money going out. Uh, now, depending on your business, this is going to be more or less if you've got big outgoings, maybe you've got um, Oliver, I'm thinking you're going to have if you're care people on your payroll, you're going to have some big outgoings there. 
um, things like construction where there's heavy costs involved um, uh, and there's cost going out before maybe income is coming in. Um, that's where you can get uh, into, you know, it needs to be carefully managed. Now there's something very wrong with this diagram. So this is showing we've got cash coming in and then we've got um, so it's coming in from the, our customers, from our sales, and it's going out in terms of our um, expenditure. But what is the wrong thing, the very worrying thing about this tank? Anybody spot it? The outflow pipe is fatter than the info pipe. So this is a, a business destined for um, going bust. If your cash outflow is greater than your cash inflow, that is heading to um, a, an emptying tank that's gonna end in tears. So we do want the cash inflow to be bigger than the cash outflow. So if you're not tracking your cash flow, get onto that. Budgeting. So who does a budget? Who forecasts um, what revenue is gonna be and what costs are gonna be happening? So forecasting ahead of time. You know, you want an annual budget to be in place for your business. And it's not something you do in January and abandon. It's something you do in whatever the beginning of your financial year is. Um, and then we refresh it at least quarterly to look because stuff happened. My goodness me, we know stuff happens. The last 12 months, you know, it's been incredibly difficult to predict what's going to happen. So we have to true it up and reforecast. Um, I, I use these Monopoly pieces. <laughs> um, uh, just it's such a great analogy. Um, I'm sure you've all played Monopoly. We, we, we have the odd game at, at home. I have one, one very savvy son and one slightly less savvy son when it comes to Monopoly. So my slightly less savvy son says, yes, I can actually finally get a hotel on these uh, properties that he's got. And he's about to fork out, you know, mega bucks to get these hotels on his string of oranges or whatever it was that he was on. Um, and I'm like, have you looked where you're coming up? Because you're about to go down that road, down that side of the board that's got your elder bro who's got hotels everywhere and your dad with hotels everywhere. You might just want a bit, keep a bit of cash because, you know, the likelihood of getting along that road without having to land and pay up is, is low. His budgeting was completely absent, it's fair to say at that point. He's like, oh, yeah. And guess what? It was quite useful that he'd still got his cash. So, yes, have you got a budget in place? So the budgeting is a forward looking planning thing. And then we want to do reporting, which is more backward looking. What has just happened? So are we tracking what's happening to your revenue? What's happening to your cost? Is it what you planned? What you, um, so we know what's happening. Uh, we're tracking and measuring things. So you should have a key set of key performance indicators, KPIs that are telling you what's happening in your business. Numbers never lie. So get those numbers in. How many leads are you getting in? What are they doing? What's your conversion? All these numbers and we'll come on to more of them. So anybody got some homework to do in terms of financial mastery? Not to be doing. So time mastery, because there's a lot to do. You're probably picking up a bit of homework already. So we need a bit of time to get that done. So think of time as a, um, an archery board, if you like. We're aiming for the bullseye in the middle. Now, at the outer edges, there's stuff, stuff that comes across our desk, stuff that is not urgent and not important. Now, these are things that we call distractions. So this might be um, some top distractions that come up in this sort of section are LinkedIn and Facebook. You go on for a very bona fide reason and suddenly 15 minutes later, you're still on there. Um, and maybe you didn't, you saw a notification, you saw a change, you saw a, a message had come in and suddenly you're off there um, and not actually checking or going on for the purpose that you actually meant to go on for. Um, emails can be great distractions. People popping by your desk if you've got team. Uh, so lots of different things that are happening that are not urgent for driving the business forward and they're not important either. Next, we come in and there are things that are urgent, but not important. Mm, what are those you're thinking? So these are things that um, they've become urgent. Um, a little thing, it just has to be done now. Um, a little example. So um, my Calendarly subscription came up. Uh, they told me it came in at yesterday evening and they're going to auto renew in four days. Um, and I actually don't want to auto renew. We're not really using it. So um, 
that is now it's not important in the scheme of running my business sorting out my flipping calendar uh, subscription is not important but it is now urgent to be done because I don't know if they're counting you know four days as Monday morning they're going to take the money out of my account um, so it's now become a Friday urgent thing so sometimes we're in this space, things, things pop up. Um, we think we're doing the right thing because it feels urgent. It's got to be done now, but we're actually deluding ourselves because it's not really driving our business forward. Um, if you have team members um, or even outsource team, sometimes if they've um, got a bit delayed on what they're doing and then they need an answer from you like now to be able to progress, it's not, it's urgent for them, but they're now putting their urgency on you. Um, and in terms of your day, it might not be urgent thing for you to be doing, but now it has become urgent. It's probably not an important thing for you to do, but it has become urgent. Into the next layer, we have our things that are urgent and important. They are right, they're for you to do, they're the, the right work, um, and it's important. This is where we call our zone of demand. This is where you should be spending, I don't know, 70% of your time, good chunk of your time here. Um, which leads, you've noticed there's a theme here, it either involves urgency or importance. It leaves in the middle the not urgent but important category. So mm, that's interesting, isn't it? So that's the most important work. This is things like your strategic planning. It's like doing your budgeting and your forecasting. These are important things. If you don't have a five year plan, is your business going to suffer in the next three months? No. So it's not urgent like that. In fact, it never becomes urgent to have a five-year plan, which is why most people don't have one. Is it important? It's vitally important if you want to achieve your full potential. So these things, when you're in this area, you know, maybe doing a competitor analysis, um, getting customer feedback. Is it urgent to get customer feedback ever? No. Is it important? Absolutely, because that's the only way you're going to be able to delight them consistently. So when you're here, we call it in the zone. And you want to be spending 10 to 20 percent of your time in the zone if you're truly going to create a business that can work without you. That's half a day to a day a week. Are you spending that time? Which area do you need to spend less time in in order to spend more time in the zone? Make yourself a note. So as we come out of um, mastery, we're gonna step into niche. Now there's a prerequisite for being able to get effective in your sales and marketing niche. And that is getting yourself out of price competition. Who feels they're in price competition at the moment? Who feels they're competing on price? Quick hands up. So if you feel you're competing on price, you're going, Helen, you're, you know, what on earth do you mean get yourself out of price competition? So let me share with this, write this down, vitally important. To get yourself out of price competition, you need to be or do something that is different to your competition but it also has to be something that is worth paying more for. And worth paying more for, I've added this one for this year, in today's environment, in this weird old COVID coronavirus environment, which we're hopefully coming out of now. Um, but it has to be something worth paying more for. So are you worth paying more for? Is your product or service worth paying more for? If there is something special about that in the way you do it, how it is, that it's worth paying more for, then fantastic, we're out of price competition. If it's not, if you're feeling you're competing on price, what could you do differently that makes it more valuable to your audience? So I want to take you now through our five levers for increasing your profits on the assumption that you have now found how you can make yourself worth paying more for. So our um, business owners I speak to, if they know their numbers, um, they will let's test this out. So how many of you know how many customers you've got? You could name, you could go, Helen, I've got 33 customers. 
So knowing the number of customers, anybody know their number of customers? Quick hands up. Great. Do we know our revenue? So the takings, the money that's coming in, um, the takings that you've got, uh, bankings, that kind of your revenue number. And then finally, your profit, net profit. What's left after all your expenses are paid for? That's the number most people know. But uh, <laughs> do you know your profit in between the accountant working it out for you at the end of the financial year? That is the key thing. You want to be knowing you these numbers every month. So great that you know these numbers, but for me, these are not the important ones to really focus on because these numbers I see as outcomes. So what do I mean by that? The number of customers you've got is an outcome of how many leads your marketing got in and how many of those leads your sales process has converted. So if, you, if you're if sitting there with 33 customers, great. Um, but you know you need some more customers. You actually need 40 to achieve your annual goal. Just knowing you need more customers doesn't help you know what you need to do. If you know, actually, on a monthly basis, I get in 10 leads. And on a monthly basis, I convert two of them to being a customer. Now I know how many months it's going to take me to get my extra seven leads. If, if I know um, that, and that can help me then say, actually, my leads are fine. That's fine. It's the conversion rate that's letting me down. So actually, I'm going to work on my conversion rate. I don't need to spend more money on marketing. Who spends more money when they want more leads? It might be your conversion rate, which is free to do because that's skills. So really important to know the difference between your number of leads you're getting in, your conversion rate, which when you multiply the two together, you're going to get your customers. Your revenue is an outcome of how many customers you've got. On average, how many times do they transact with you per month or per year, however you like to calculate this? And what's the average value of each of those transactions? And if you multiply how many customers you've got by the average number of transactions, by the average value of that transaction, you'll get to your revenue number. Mathematically, that is correct. No accountant will ever calculate your revenue like that, but that is uh, an alternative, mathematically correct way of getting to your revenue. And again, it's far more useful if we're trying to grow our revenue. Now we know what we can do to grow it. We need more customers or they need to be transacting more frequently with us, or they need to be spending more money when they do. It's that simple. So we've got our revenue. Profit is an outcome of our profit margin. So what we're making above our cost, revenue coming in divided by, sorry, cost. Yeah, net of cost divided by revenue. So actually, I'm far more interested in the blue numbers here than the red numbers. So let's try this with some numbers. So in my example, I, um, I like to use a, a dog kennel an example here. Let's see who's awake this morning. Why do I use a dog kennel as example? Because we start off with how many leads? Oh, really calling for a Friday morning, sorry. Um, so we've got, let's look at this annually. We've got 4,000 leads coming in a year to our dog kenneling business. We're gonna say, um, the conversion rates so of those 4,000 leads that come in, they convert 25% of those, which means we have 1,000 customers a year. With me so far? I've kept the numbers nice and round here to help with the maths. Um, so we have 1,000 customers. We're going to say, on average, they do two transactions a year. So that sounds like they're, they're going on holiday twice a year, dropping dog off at kennel. Their average value sale is £100. So actually, they're only going for a weekend holiday. If anybody's got a dog and has looked at the price of kennels, that's about a three to, day, three to four day stay. Um, so they're having a three to four day holiday twice a year, spending £100 each time. So if we multiply that through, we've got 1,000 customers transacting twice a year, um, at a thousand pounds a transaction. So that's giving us a revenue of 200,000. We've got a profit margin of 25%, so we're making 50,000 profit. Are you with me so far? 
So that's our profit and our starting position. So now let's look at what happens when we start working on the business, working in that niche layer. Um, and we're gonna look at increasing these numbers, just 10% each. So here we go, this is where we started off. This is our base point. Um, and guess what, a bit more homework. If you don't know these numbers is work out what's your base point. Um, and if that's looking a bit confusing, I'll help you do that. So um, I'm very happy to have a, a call with, I offer in fact a pro bono call with everybody who attends one of my webinars um, so we can work these numbers out for you because this is really the key to growing your business um, significantly and consistently. So we take our number of leads and what we wanna do is do some marketing activity to increase those leads by 10%. So we're dog kennels business, what could we do? Maybe we could um, create a partnership. Where, where do dog, dog owners hang out? Well, they all have to go to the vets, don't they? So where, maybe we, we get the vets to put in a little leaflet every time they put in um, a prescription for the dog in a, in a bag, they put one of our leaflets in there with it. We have a poster on the notice board um, when everybody's waiting to be called through to the vet. Do you think that would increase our leads? That would help some way. What about what about maybe we um, we have some leaflets in the uh, or we speak to the uh, a, a travel agent, have a partnership there. What about we do a referral program for um, our existing clients and ask them to recommend us to one of their dog owning friends. Um, so lots of different strategies we can think about here to increase the number of leads we get by 10%. So not a huge increase, just 10%, but because we've got 4,000 to begin with, 10% increase, we're gonna get an extra 400. Now, we're gonna look at our conversion rates. So this is all about your sales process. So who has a sales process? Who has defined what are the steps that their prospects go through uh, in order to, to purchase at the end. So at Kennels, they'll absolutely, they have an inquiry, they maybe send some information. Typically you'll go for a look-see visit, go and visit the kennel. So what about if they invest some time working out what's the best way to showcase their kennel? How are they gonna show the outside areas, the nice walking, where the dogs stay, et cetera? Who are they gonna choose to do that tour? They're gonna choose the most, um, that the, the, the team leader or the, the employee who can really engage, who's very confident, who loves the kennels and can be totally passionate about it as they take this prospect around the kennels. So if we had a defined route round with some definite messages we're gonna say at each point on our tour, do you think we could increase that conversion rate by 10%? Now I'm not saying add it, we're not going from 25% to 35%, we're increasing it by 10%. So increasing it by 2.5%, to 27.5%. So if we do the maths, we've now got 4,400 times 27.5. We've got an extra 210 customers. Now the fun starts. So if we look at our number of transactions, um, how can we get them to come back more frequently every year? We want them three times or two and a half times, not two. In fact, we just want to increase it by 10%, 2.2 times. So some of them we need to get coming back. How about we advertise a um, Christmas shopping daycare option? Um, you want to go up to town uh, next Christmas when we can, um, uh, but don't leave poor dog on its own because you're going to go for the theatre afterwards. They can come and stay one night at the kennels. That's an extra transaction to what they would have done. So if we have a few of those little plans, um, get to 2.2, we can increase our average sale. What's the very easiest way to increase the average value of a sale? It's to put your price up. Who's put the prices up in the last year? Good habit, every year put your prices up. Um, so we get an increase that we can add services in. Whilst the dogs at the kennels, they could have their grooming session. They could have a pamper day. What else could we do? We could, lots of different things we can add on in a dog kennels. So just looking for a 10% increase that's going from 100 to 110. What happens when we multiply that through? If you don't believe me, get your calculator out. Um, but this is right. Uh, so look, our revenue has gone up by 92,820 pounds. That's a 46% increase in your revenue. 
in this annual example. And we've not done anything wacky yet. And we aren't. We're just nudging each of these numbers forwards. The last one to work on, profit margin. So if we put our prices up, that's going to help the profit anyhow. If we manage to add increase the volume by having more customers and we haven't had to increase the costs in, in line with that, we've held the cost steady and, and within existing capacity, say, again, volume will naturally increase your profit margin. And then we could do specifics. We could take the 10% challenge. Look at all your costs. What do you really need? What can you renegotiate? Who renegotiates your electric gas for those of you in offices? Phone systems, goodness me, people can save so much on phone systems. Um, great one to look at each year. Um, or you just choose like I've just choose. I don't need that subscription anymore. We weren't using it to its full, um, the, not to create the, the value that the cost is, is there. So we're going to take that off. So keep looking at those costs so you can get a 10% a increase in margin, um, which then is going to give us 80,000 profit. That's an extra 30, over 30,000 more profit when you started with 50,000. That's a 61% increase. So we've got a 61% increase having done five lots of 10% increase. So five lots of 10 would be 50, but we've got a 61% increase because they're all multiplied through. We've got that compound effect. Who'd like a 61% increase in their profits? What would that do for your business? What would that do for you? Because the profit is a, you know, that, that's what's available for you. So if you need to know these numbers, if you need to know these numbers to get accessing that 61%, let's get a date in the diary and we'll work out your numbers. So that's niche. Is that worth spending a bit of time in niche to get those numbers flowing? Absolutely. But that's not the end of it. We're only on step two. Step three, leverage. Leverage is all about making this business work. So the commercial bit is mastery. We're making it profitable through niche. That works is happening in leverage. This is getting it working smoothly for you. Smoothly, consistently and automated. So this is where we're putting in systems. We love systems. Think of systems. Here's a lovely acronym for you. Saving you stress, time, energy, money. And if we want another S for systems, sanity. Um, when processes work for you, rather than you doing heavy lifting all the time, there is someone else or a machine or some software doing that heavy lifting. Life becomes easier. But you have to get through to um, mastery and niche before you can do this. So we're putting in our systems, we know exactly how we want things to run. We can now start working on expanding with our team. And this is where I think the fun really starts. So I love, this is one of my favorite um, slides that we go through. So the cycle of business. As a business owner, often when I start talking to them, as a business owner, you've got all these hats you're wearing um, and all these, you know, all feels like it's sitting on your shoulders. So you're worrying about the business, particularly this last year. Who's been worrying about the business? What do we do next? How do we pivot next? What are we doing? Have I still got any customers left? Have they gone? Rrr, um, can we get stuff? You know, are things open. Rrr. A lot of concern about the business. Owners also concerned about the customers. Um, are they happy? Are they staying? Are they paying? All that good stuff. And of course, they're managing the team as well. So you're pulled in multi-directions. Anybody feel that multi-directional pulling going on? Um, whereas actually the biggest unlock to managing and running a, a business that can work without you, the, the route to get there is for you as the business owner to really focus on your team. You put them as your priority front and square. So they have got absolute clarity about what they're doing. You're giving them directly or indirectly the development and training to get better and improve it. They're engaged. They're loving their work. They're being proactive. You've got the right people in the right spots. All of that. 
they will then look after your customers by giving great customer service and a great experience for your customers. When your customers get a great experience, they will then be very much happy and, and generous in terms of their referrals. They'll be paying you on time because um, they respect and like working with you. And therefore, they're looking after the business um, and they're repeat business saying that they're bringing repeat business, they're referring, etc. cetera. Um, and then with that, the business is going to be profitable. It's working smoothly and it, it looks after you. So in terms of profit. And so we get this virtuous circle. And it's so interesting. I've seen this over the five years. I would, you know, start maybe working with an owner on um, we do the five ways that the levers that I've just talked about. We go, OK, we need to get um, we need to get more leads in. So we'll start on the marketing. But actually, we're going, actually, you know, we've got enough leads. We're, we're going to go to the sales process. Let's optimize what we've got. But actually, we've got unhappy customers. And it all leads back to, well, actually, why well, have we got unhappy customers? Because they're not getting the service they want. Uh, or the sales team are skilled to convert the leads we're getting and it ends up back at team. Um, and then sometimes it ends up back at the owner. Actually, you get the team you deserve. Is your leadership deserving of good enough to attract the team that are going to be good enough to look after your customers as you want them looked after? So it really is a cycle that is so important. So what do we need to do to look after this team? Seven keys. First of all, as I said, it starts with strong leadership. There is only one that person, you know, who's going to lead the passion and the direction um, of this business, and it's you. Y your team will not be more passionate than you. Um, so we need strong direction, strong leadership, strong decision making um, from you as the leader. We then need a common goal for everybody to get around, uh, to get motivated behind, and this common goal. The trick here is in the word common. It's for everybody. If the goal is a profit goal, who benefits from that? You. Um, so it's got, that's not very motivating for the rest of the team. So it's got to be something that engages them and drives them forward. You need to be clear on what we call the rules of the game. So what are the rules of the game? What I mean there is, if you think about sport, um, we're a bit of a rugby family. So, uh, you know, there are rules, you know, you have to throw the ball backwards whilst you're running forwards. Um, there's a ton of rules around scrum. Um, there's, you know, you get points for doing certain things, et cetera. Um, there's rules. Now, what are the rules of the game in your business? And there will be. Some of you, um, Oliver, in your care world, you, you're going to have a, a heap of legal compliance rules. Um, but there's also rules, you know, how many times does the phone ring before it picks up? What's the dress code? When do you turn up? What's the expectation? Have you got all? Because if that isn't clear, people can't operate to that level if they don't know what the level expected is. You then need an action plan. The team need to know what they're meant to be doing. What is the plan for the next quarter? They're not going to deliver it if they don't know it. Um, so have you got an action plan in place? And for some of you, this might not be... Um, employee team members at the moment, but the same applies if you've got freelancer, virtual team members. They can support you best when they know this stuff. When you've got very clear about the rules of the game and there's a clear action plan to, to follow, then this is almost the most difficult part. You have to support risk-taking. What does that mean? It doesn't mean willy-nilly let, let it all happen. But once you've given your team members the wherewithal to do their roles, you have to step back and let them do it. There is nothing more disengaging than micromanagement. When you've given them all the clarity, then you have to let them get on with it. Check in, have regular one-to-ones, but let them get on with it. Do not micromanage. So, uh, and as a business owner, that can be really tricky because you know, many of you have started, you were the only employee, you've done every job in the business. Um, so it's really easy to step in and go, oh, no, no, you know, does it have to be done that way? If the output is, is to the level you need, um, they may have a slightly different approach. You, as long as that's getting the right output, that, that might be okay. <clears throat> Finally, we need... Um, 100% participation and 100% inclusion. 
Um, and it's not, I was being indecisive here. For me, those are two different words. It's the two sides, it takes two to tango here. Your team need to be participating 100%. I'm giving 100%, being proactive. Um, but in order to do that, in order to participate, you need to include them. You need to invite them in. They need to be part of that planning, part of creating that action plan. And then finally, the world is forever changing. Things are evolving. Technology is moving forward. We always need to be having um, a learning and development approach with our team members. That Everybody needs to be, including yourself, learning continually um, to stay ahead of the game. So for those of you up, up at team, you know, just assess yourself on these elements here. What have you got in place or not? Um, and for those of you maybe just thinking about getting into that, these are the things you need to be, be working on. So we're coming up to the hour. Um, anybody read Jim, Jim Rohn's book? Um, fantastic. He's massively, uh, I mean, he's, he's passed on now, unfortunately, but uh, writing back in the 70s, I think, but so much of what he says is true, and I love these phrases. This is particularly pertinent to this last 12 months. Never wish your life were easier. Wish that you were better. In every situation, there are always winners. And those winners are people who are making themselves better, uh, thinking proactively. And this other one, very challenging. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work harder on yourself. That's all about working smarter, learning, improving how we do things. Um, so work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Because if you just work hard on the job, the likelihood is you're just going to repeat. Um, and, and cycle at the same point because you're not moving forward, you're just doing the same thing each time. Whereas actually if you can find little different incremental ways of doing things differently, you can see how that adds up. So I hope through this, um, our conversation, words, words have inspired you, um, but it's only action that is actually going to take you closer to having that business that can work without you. So I want to help you take what you've learned here into action. So I've got a couple of options for you here. Um, you, absolutely, one of these is available to you. And whilst I'm doing this, actually, we'd love some feedback. So Guy, could you put the feedback link into the chat box? Um, so really quick form, um, just to give us feedback on how you found this webinar. It's also the place where you're going to um, record, you know, which one of these you'd like, or just literally write it in the chat box now. Um, so one thing I could do is we can go through um, and work out your numbers. So we'll do a health check. We'll, we'll look at the principles we've talked about this morning and a few more and assess where you and your business are at and what are the priorities for you to move forward. Where is the low hanging fruit? What are the options to move first on? So that's our business health check. Um, be delighted to take um, take you through that process and the and or. Um, I have a wonderful tool for those of you maybe further up the line here or wanting to know where you're at at the moment um, that will create a business valuation. So just to see how much value you've got in your business at the moment, if you were to, to sell um, or if selling your business ultimately is um, one of your goals. Let's see where you're at now, see what you'd want to um, sell it for and what the gap is and how to get you closing that gap. So one or uh, two, two ways there to help you take what you've learned now into the business. Um, and, and please do click on that link and it really is gonna take you five minutes or less to, to do the, first, I think it's like six questions, just to tick, tick box on the form would be fantastic. So I think we're top of the hour. I can uh, stay on here. I know a number of you might have appointments to go rushing off to, but if you've got any questions, I am gonna draw a breath and please uh, go for those questions now.